Good evening, it's good to see everyone. We have Randall and Kim visiting with us from Owasso, temporarily, <laughs> about to move to Tennessee. All right, this evening we're going to be talking about character, Jesus living a life of integrity. Um, the Lead Like the Lord is the book um, by Kirk Brothers, and so we've been going through a lot of his uh, character traits, a lot of his traits, you want to look at it? But I need that back. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> I've got one more week to teach. <laughs> oh, <laughs> point offer is. Um, Saul, would you lead us in word of prayer before we begin? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, Lord. Uh, please be with Kenny as he delivers his lesson, Lord. Thank you so much for the leadership that we have in this church, Lord, and the opportunities that we have to learn and to grow closer to you. Thank you so much for this change of seasons to remind us that we're not in control, but we have a loving Father that protects us and uh, gives us what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. So just a little bit of a catch-up. We've, uh, we've talked about the fact that Jesus spent his time with more of his time with the 12 rather than 1,200 because those 12 could make a greater impact on the kingdom than trying to teach 1,200 that. And so he spent a lot of time with the apostles, training them to be the next leaders. Well, the word character, we always start out trying to define stuff. What do you think of when somebody talks about character? Class clown. Yeah, that, that was my thought exactly. I thought, I don't like this title for the chapter. I really didn't. I, I thought I, I'm referring to somebody's personality and uh, maybe be misbehaving. That, that guy's a character. You know, so I, I kind of had a negative connotation with that. Um, they said that Webster's um, moral excellence and firmness was a Webster definition. I didn't see that when I was looking at the definitions. I saw this one, the mental and moral qualities distinctive to an individual. Just mental qualities. That's kind of what I thought of as when I heard the word character, kind of synonyms, their personality, their temperament. So that's what I think of when I think of character. I think a better C word would have been credibility. His credibility and the definition for that, <clears throat> the quality of being trusted and believed in. And the idea is that, you know, somebody has to have credibility if you're going to follow them. In order to be a good leader, they have to be responsible, they have to be credible in order for you to believe in them so you can follow them. Trustworthiness, dependability, a reputation. Another word that comes up a lot in the lesson is integrity. Uncommon adherence to a code of moral, artistic, or other values. Adhering to those values, the things, and, and we'll talk more, we'll talk about our values too. Do you have a moral compass or a code that the values are pointing towards God? Do you have something inside of you that's telling you this is the way we need to go. What direction are we going to go? I saw that little picture and I thought that was funny. A homing pigeon looking at a road map, <laughs> trying to find well, where do we go from here. We went to Wichita for a funeral this past weekend, and um, everything was fine until I turned off the road, and I lost my, my cell signal, my GPS signal, and, and it, just, it just went dead. And I thought, where do we go? <laughs> I said, well, we're going to have to get to a major intersection and find what the intersections are. And then I could look it up and go, oh, well, we were just two miles off, a mile north and a mile east, and we were there. So anyway, we found it. I, I felt like this homing pigeon, though. In the book, Kirk Brothers talked about he became a beekeeper a few years ago. And he was telling some stories about the, the bees and how... The older bees, which is kind of a funny term, because during the summer, they only live about 30 days. 
30 to 60 days is the life expectancy of a bee. In the winter time, they live about 200 days. He didn't say that in the book. That was some extra I just went to look up. Um, but he talked about that the mature bees would come back, you know, the, the female bees are the ones that go out and do the collecting. They, they got these little sacks on their legs and they stuff it full of pollen. And then they come back to the nest and when they find a bunch of, a place where you can get a lot of pollen quickly, easily, they come back and they'll do a dance to signal to the other bees where it is. And they'll go, they'll do their dance in a direction and they'll say, okay, and for however many seconds that little dance is, is how far from the nest it is. And so one second is equivalent to six tenths of a mile. So you had zero four zero <laughs> for six tenths of a mile and you're gonna find pollen. Well, and he talks about the fact that the, the younger bees, they're only about a week old, I guess, <laughs> since they only live a month, their sense of direction isn't developed and they get lost and they can't find their way back to the nest. So that was interesting. But all animals, oops, went the wrong way. All animals use this sense of a magnetic direction whenever they're hibernating, or hibernate, migrating. <laughs> I'm gonna hibernate south. <laughs> but when they migrate, the, even the sea turtles use a sense of magnetic to find their direction um, I saw in the news, this is kind of off the subject, um, I saw a report today about, they said there was a crack in the magnetic field which allowed solar winds to enter. And over in Norway, I don't know if you guys saw this, the, um, the aurora that came in was pink and purple. That's really rare. You don't, you don't see the aurora pink and purple. You'll have to go home and Google it and look at them. But um, they use magnetic, and they use the angle of the sun. So, you know, at noon, when the sun's only this high on the horizon, it's time to head south. <laughs> As I said, the, the younger, immature animals tend to get lost. Their sense of direction, their compass, isn't developed to where they're going in the right direction. What about your internal compass? Are you going in the right direction? Headed the right way? This is a little kind of a play on that English word, but I thought this was funny. In 2 Kings 3 and 11, Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we might ask, uh, that we might seek the Lord's direction? Wanting some guidance from the Lord. Which way? What should you do? He had uh, three quotes in the book that I liked. Uh, Kuzi and Posner, these are leadership researchers that wrote a book, and they said, the most important personal quality people look for and admire in a leader is personal credibility. Credibility is the foundation of leadership. If people do not believe in the messenger, they will not believe the message. This finding has been so consistent for 20 years that we've come to call it the first law of leadership. Having credibility, very important. And that, that's not just in the church, that's in the secular world, in you know, trying to run a business. You need somebody that's credible to be the head of that company or what's going to happen. People are going to lose faith in the product, the service, whatever. They won't use or buy your merchandise if you're not credible. William Cohen said, in simple terms, it's integrity. Adherence to a set of values that incorporate honesty and freedom from deception. Integrity is more than honesty. It means doing the right thing regardless of the circumstances or the inconvenience to the leader or the organization. Integrity. And then uh, Abraham Lincoln said, character is like a tree. And reputation is its shadow. The shadow is what we think of it, but the tree is the real thing. 
And then Kirk's brother said, Jesus is known around the world 2,000 years after his death. That's the shadow that he cast. So can you imagine the majestic tree that casts such a shadow that 2,000 years later, people are still studying him and seeing what he has done. Questions? Acts chapter 10. <clears throat> Peter's testimony about Jesus, and it's a long chapter, so I'm not going to stand up here and read the whole chapter for you. We're going to read a few verses and summarize some and then finish it up. So verses 1 and 2, Acts chapter 10. Now there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was all his household. He did many acts of charity for the people and prayed to God regularly. He's a really good man. And what happens next? He says people that are eating have to cash off some money. Yeah. He has a vision. He's supposed to send for Peter. Send a Joppa and get Peter. So he gets two of his servants and one of his devout soldiers to go to Joppa to look for Peter. And it says he's staying at Simon the Tanner's house. Well, a tanner lived kind of on the outskirts of town. The way they tanned the hides back then smelled really bad. And so they kind of lived outside of town. You know, nobody wants to live near that. And so it was easy to find the tanner's house. Okay. And Peter sees a vision. A sheet is let down, and it's full of unclean animals. And he's told, rise, kill, and eat. Never have I eaten anything that's going to make me ceremonially unclean. I can't eat this. And he says, what I have made clean, you have to look it up. God has made clean. Don't consider something unclean that God has made clean. Something like that. That's the Hicks and paraphrase. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Come on. <sighs> Having trouble. Try this again. New Testament. Acts. And somebody already have it? Verse 15. What God has made clean, you must not consider ritually unclean. He sees this vision three times. And it's and I think it's the timing. I think it's about the time he's through with that. And he's pondering this. And then suddenly these three men, two servants and a soldier from Cornelius, shows up the house. And the spirit tells Peter, there's three men at the door looking for you. Three men. And so he goes downstairs and, and says, I'm Peter, and I'm behind on my clicks. So they show up, and they're inquiring of Peter. And Peter goes to Caesarea with them, and many have gathered. It's not just Cornelius and his household and his family. It says many people are gathered to hear this message. And so... Cornelius tells about the message he heard and that he was supposed to send to Peter or send to, get to Joppa to get Peter. And Peter tells about the message that he saw. And then he continues this. Verse 38. With respect to Jesus from Nazareth, that God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, he went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. He went about doing good. Sounds just like Cornelius. Can you go back up to the first of the chapter? Cornelius, he was a charitable guy. He always prayed to God. And Jesus is going around doing good. Both guys were doing good. A comparison of them. They're both men of action. They were doers. They didn't just sit by and watch and see what happened. They went out and helped. He didn't just teach to do good. He 
did what he preached. He gave them visual lessons. We talked uh, last week about, or two weeks ago, about Jesus washing their feet. And, you know, they all walk in, and the basin is there, and they all ignore it and go sit down. I don't have to wash anybody's feet. And so Jesus gets up, and he goes over and takes off his outer clothing, and he ties that sash around his waist, and he's washing the disciples' feet to teach them a lesson because they've been arguing about who's the greatest. And Jesus is showing them because he was the greatest, but yet I'm going to serve you. I'm going to show you how you should serve others. He went about doing good. Serving others and doing good distinguishes a lot of leaders. There are some leaders out there wouldn't be caught dead with a broom in their hand, sweeping up, cleaning up. That's beneath them. They're not going to stoop that low and do something that they're paying somebody to do. Have you seen that? Some? <laughs> Acts 1, Luke writes, I wrote the former account, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Not only did he teach, but he did it. He practiced what he preached. Jesus preaching. A key term in Jesus preaching is hypocrite. Do you know where the word comes from? From the drama, from the theater, the actors were hypocrites because they were pretending to be someone they're not. Pretending to be a person or a character that they were not. There's the Greek word. Hypocrites, I guess. An actor or a pretender. This word appears 17 times in the New Testament. All 17 times. It was Jesus that said it. You hypocrites. Mark 7, 6, an example. He said to them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You hypocrites. You're just pretending to be religious. Honoring me with your lips, but your heart is far, far away. Jesus did not want pretenders. He was looking for people of character, of credibility, and integrity. His own character? Through the temptations. Now, the, the temptations occurred right after his baptism. Is that significant? He's just been baptized, and Jesus, or the voice from heaven, says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. And he goes off into the wilderness, led by the Spirit, to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. And after 40 days, he is hungered. Temptation awful fo often is followed, uh, or often follows, key decisions to follow God. If you decide, I'm going to be a better leader, I'm going to be more motivated to fill in blank, serve in this area, whatever. Once you make that decision, you may find yourself facing more trials, more challenges, more people wanting part of your time, <clears throat> taking your that chance away to serve. And again, a voice from heaven has just said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Satan says, if you're the son of God, Tell these stones to become bread. Prove it. And then again in verse 9, if you're the son of God, you know, throw yourself off of this, this uh, pinnacle, the temple, and his angels are going to rescue you. They're going to save you. If you're the son of God, prove it. That would be quite a sensational show. All these people are in Jerusalem. Just throw yourself off the temple. 
but he couldn't do it. He didn't do it. Peter warned, he said, be sober and alert, your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl, looking for someone to devour. Our areas of strength often become targets. The devil knows your weaknesses and your strengths, and he's going to attack you every way he can. If you're good at managing money, Satan is probably going to dangle a carrot in front of you and, you know, here's a, here's a way you can get even more money. Some dishonest game to tempt you. Um, if you stand before people <laughs> and proclaim a message, he's probably going to tempt you with pride. I was thinking about this statement, and, and I thought, this has happened to me twice at North MacArthur. On a Wednesday night, a quarter that I was scheduled to teach, and no one showed up. No one came to class. Everybody went to the other classes, and I was just in here by myself. And it was funny. Nobody had shown up, and I went over just to, to kind of push the door to, and I was going to start packing my stuff up. Well, I see Craig Dodgy coming across the foyer out there, and he's about to the door, and, and I'm thanking everyone for choosing to come to the class tonight. And, and he stopped and looked in, <laughs> peeked in around the door. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> so I don't know if, if that was, uh, if I was being prideful and it was a message to me, but it happened not. One quarter, but two. So, there you go. Jesus' privacy. Of course, when he goes out to be tempted, he's by himself in the wilderness. Mark says that he's with the animals. So Luke says, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where for 40 days he endured temptations from the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were completed, he was famished. So Satan tempts him to turn those stones into bread. They probably looked a lot like a loaf of bread already. If you're the son of God, he's in the wilderness alone. Temptations will strike you when you're alone. They'll come at you even when other people aren't looking. You're going to have temptations that are going to face you. John Wooden said, The true test of a man's character is what he does when no one is watching. In private, we take our mask off and we stop pretending. Sometimes when we go out in public and you have to put a mask on, oh, I'm going to have to act this way. I think of the fans going to football games that they've got their face all painted up and everything just so they can go be crazy. And then they come home and they have to wash their makeup off. Take their mask off. Stop pretending you're a Sooner fan. <laughs> Her brother said, Jesus understood that when the amphitheater of humanity was empty, there was another audience which was still watching. There's a heavenly balcony in the auditorium of life. Angels long to look and hear these things. That's what Peter said. Matthew 6, 6, Jesus said, and, and when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father in secret who sees you in secret and he will reward you. So even when you're alone or you think you're alone, you still have an audience. Remember this. It's an important thing to, to being a person of character and integrity. It helps you to know that, oh, 
I'm still being watched. Even when no one's around. He mentions in the in his book, this other book, The Extraordinary Leader by Dr. Joseph Fulton. And he talks about in the book that there is this tent, and there's five poles holding the tent up, and each of the poles are focus on results, personal capability, leading change, interpersonal skills. But the center pole is the character. The main pole that's holding the whole tent up is character. And if that pole's not there, that tent is not going to stand. It's coming down. U.S. Senator Alan Simpson was introducing President Gerald Ford at Harvard University in 1999. And he said, if you have integrity, nothing else matters. And if you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. Integrity. And ladies, the, the book is written with uh, male leaders in mind, elders, deacons, preachers. So um, not really addressing the ladies that he talks about. Elders honoring agreements that they've made. Preachers honoring promises they made and practice what they preach. Youth ministers never do anything inappropriate, always behaving maturely. Deacons remain good stewards of church funds, doing the right thing when no one is looking. Temptations. I, I just a, a side story. I was, I hate to say this, I was in the union when I was an air traffic controller, and I was the I was the treasurer for the union, which meant I had to collect the money and make the deposits and fill out all the tax returns and all that stuff. And you had to file a report with the Department of Labor also, which is even more painful than the IRS forms. So anyway, um, we were being audited. You have to get audited every couple of years or something. So they came in to audit us, and the guy is questioning me about the funds, and we had several vending machines at work. And I would just dump all the coins into a bag, take it to my bank, let them dump it into a counting machine, and then they would cut me a, a cashier's check for that amount that I would take to the credit union where... The union had its bank account. They didn't have a money machine over there. And uh, so anyway, I'd take it over, that cashier's check over and deposit it. And he said, no, he said, you have to roll the money here. You have to have somebody verify how much money there is and then go deposit it and all this. Oh, it was such a pain. And finally I said, I'm done. <laughs> Get out of this. Somebody else can file your reports. Temptations. There's three categories of sin. The lust of the flesh, having inappropriate relationships with the opposite sex, most likely, shouldn't be, or not at all, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the lust of the eyes, um, covet your neighbor's car, your neighbor's wife, pornography, all that falls under lust of the eyes. The pride of life, sacrificing our principles. I remember uh, there was a book and a movie called Tuesdays with Maury. Did you read that? Mitch Album wrote the book, and he's a, a sports columnist for a Chicago newspaper. And one of his college professors, Maury, had gotten sick, and so he was going up every week and spending Tuesdays with Maury. And um, the one line I remember from the book, um, Maury is asking him about his life. You know, you, you had these grand plans. You were going to write a Pulitzer Prize winning novel and, and you had all these great plans. He said, what happened? He said, well, I sacrificed them for a bigger paycheck. He gave up on his dreams 
to support his family. It's, uh, it, it's kind of the gist that I got from it, but that, that line just, I don't know, it poked me in the heart. <laughs> Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. You want to do the right thing? Boy, it's so tempting to do something else. So watch and pray. Watch, acknowledge our weakness. That's pretty good. Sorry. Avoid tempting situations and having an accountability. Sometimes you have somebody that you trust in, some partner that is going to help you. If they're struggling with the same thing, you guys can get together. How are you doing? Um, just debating on whether I should mention that or not. Um, a, a member, former member, that's had a problem with drinking, and he was celebrating, or he was he was happy to announce that he just got a significant chip for not having a drink for two hundred days. So he's gotten to where he, he has a team, an accountability team, somebody that is helping him get through this as he struggles with it. And to pray, watch and pray, confession, repentance, seeking God's help in fighting temptation. Ian A. Fair is a uh, minister at McDermott Road Church of Christ in Plano, Texas. And this is what he said. Values form the ethical gel that hold an organization together. The compass that gives it direction. The integrity that gives it respectability. And the parameters that give it stability. Having the values of the things that we've been talking about. The, the integrity, the credibility, the character. Being a responsible stand-up type person that people will gladly serve, will get behind and be glad to help you out. Thoughts? Y'all are quiet for me. Consider your internal values. What determines your values? What's important to you? What is steering you where's your compass pointing what's the source of your values are you living a life consistent with those values well we all want to go to heaven so there's you know working our path that way get our compass pointed in that direction and are these choices that we have to make going to get us there? Or is it going to take us off the path? People with character. People who do the right in, in a secret place will, all, will also do the right, do what is right in a public place. I can't read. When you're doing the right thing when nobody's looking, you're going to do the right thing when people are looking or when they catch you and by surprise you're at the store and you've got your mind on one thing and, and uh, you didn't know that somebody that knew you was watching you. so if you're doing the right thing you're going to do the right thing all the time if you're, you're doing it in private you're going to do it in public. And others are going to be drawn to them. Those people that, that have the character, the integrity, the credibility, they're going to be attracted to them. And that's that's what drew a lot of the people to Jesus. That and the fact that he could do miracles. John 8, 12, And Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Some people say, well, this is a contradiction because he also said, you are the light of the world. We're the light of the world to others. 
Are there two? No, there's not two. Jesus' light is filtering through our character. It was described as a light shining through a, a stained glass window. And so we're radiating that light to others so that others can see. You're the light of the world. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. We're not to hide our light. We're to let our light shine so that others can see it, so that we can lead others. Letting your light shine, being that guiding light to help others find the right path to get to where they're supposed to go. I've rushed through my lesson. <laughs> now it's your turn to call me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about your the prior slide about um, you know, you know how we behave in, in secret or, or in public. Um, just make me think about you know we're, we're influencing others whether we want to or not. That, that's not a question. That's the only thing is, that, <coughs> the question is, what are, are we influencing good or are we influencing bad? Because yeah. uh, people, like you were, you were saying, I mean, people are always looking. And, and especially as Christians, um, you know, we're, we're, we're giving, um, we're painting a picture of others what, what that looks like. And it should be, it should be letting our light shine through them. Yeah, the old adage that we're the only Bible that some people are going to read. The life that we live is what they're going to see. So they're learning through us, whether you realize it or not. And I, I think about growing up and talking to people in the youth group, the kids in the youth group, about behaving and acting right in public, in worship. I said, because guess what? All those little kids have their eyes on you and they're going to imitate what you're doing oh I hadn't thought about that and it's the same in each age bracket there's younger people looking at the older people for examples I read a, a story this week it, it caught my eye it, it said uh, there, there's the idea of mentorship where you're teaching the younger workers, younger leaders, helping them to mature into a mature leader. But now there's reverse mentorship to where the younger kids are teaching us older kids how to use electronics. <laughs> and I mean, they're, they're having to show us how to do our job more efficiently, better, more better, so there's reverse member of mentorship going on in the workplace. Wayne, you have a thought for five minutes? Well, it always <clears throat> comes back again to me to something that we uh, as Christians like to use. Uh, Tim's been speaking about it on Wednesday nights here for the last couple of weeks. He did it tonight, but before he did, that a lot of times uh, our presence is not necessarily for us. Our presence around each other is to the magnify Lord. that light. In Hebrews 10, 25, we've always said, that's what I grew up with, that said, here's the reason why uh, we come to church, because the writer of the Hebrew letter says, not forsaking our own together and so on. And I said, I think we've missed the point with that. Now, it, it's not tradition. Uh, it's not because um, I want pride to take over and a light to shine. And let us consider how to stimulate one another. The reason we, we come together, whether it's Wednesday night or 
or, or whenever. <clears throat> it's, it's to encourage. It's to stimulate. It's to be. And the only word missing from the character thing you started with was, um, I understand character. But I also understand if you put an A, the letter A, in front of that. A character. Now you've got two different meanings. One meaning, as you defined it, you're a little rascal. Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're really showing off. But character is what the roots of what we should be looking at and saying, yeah, ethically and, and uh, just whichever way morally, that we can be a, a, uh, an instrument of God by letting others see what we do. And it encourages them because we're here. Um, does anybody know the history behind why do we have our midweek service on Wednesday night? Um, I thought this was strange because uh, uh, when I went to another country, and their tradition is they have their midweek service on Tuesday night rather than Wednesday night. And that's what we're going to do next week. <laughs> so I just thought that was, that seemed out of place. It's like, wait, you go to church on Tuesday? <laughs> Where's that in the Bible? <laughs> some do it on Thursday. Yeah, and some do it on Thursdays. And I just, I don't know why we started because Wednesday's the middle of the week. And I guess that they just decided we need that shot in the arm on in the middle of the week to get us through till Friday. <laughs> so homework for next week. <laughs> Any other thoughts? I remember listening to a sermon several years ago, and it was somebody who had some sort of addiction, and it was a secret sin, and they um, had kept it hidden, but then once they got into a more influential leadership role in the church, that's when it was exposed, and he was talking about, you know, as you grow and develop, you really need to scrutinize and um, bring light on the darkness and the sin in your life, because Satan's going to wait until you're at the top of your influence before he exposes your sin to everybody else because it's going to hurt the church more. Yeah. Uh, and just the idea that you have an audience watching you all the time. I mean, that's going to, uh, that kind of influences your character, your integrity, to know that God and the angels are watching to see what you're doing. You think you're alone, but you still have an audience. Somebody that you're going to have to answer to eventually. So, all right, well, let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you for the time that we've had to freely assemble together and study a portion of your word. Be with us as we travel to our homes. Give us a safe journey. And as we go throughout this week, help us to be people of character, to shine our light to our neighbors, co workers. Friends, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.